hello and welcome. I keep on coming up against the discovery of the existence of what might be called a, a particular mindset, a way of looking at things that shifts, shifts the view dramatically depending on your first principles. To my great surprise, I've come to discover that there is a particular Catholic mindset and it's different from the one that I used to have when I was a Protestant. So it's taken me back. But let me give you an example if I can. For example, I, I used to love pottery or wooden chalices and patterns. <clears throat> I had it in my mind that Jesus exemplified humility and poverty and surely he would have used the simplest things in life, especially at the Last Supper, and so perhaps should we. I was ambivalent about all the ornate golden chalices and patterns that the historic Catholic Church gathered and and used down the ages. Surely these were might be examples of perhaps trying to buy God's favour by, by bribing him, or maybe just examples of the association of power and prestige in church, misplaced in the drama of the Incarnation. And then I discovered the Eucharistic miracles. To tell you the truth, nothing had prepared me for their impact. I'd always been hopeful but ambivalent about what so many people called ambiguously the, the real presence in the Eucharist. By ambivalent I mean that I believed something happened in the consecration and Jesus came closer through the bread and the wine. But I always thought that perhaps the whole theology of transubstantiation was maybe a, a quasi-legitimate expression of faith grasping for a way of articulating itself and using Aristotle because his language and concepts were, were helpful, didn't really describe anything. I wasn't sure at all what to make of the centuries of apparent Eucharistic miracles from Lanciano onwards, but I suspected hagiography and maybe religious exaggeration. Nothing at all prepared me for the discovery when I first came across the Buenos Aires miracle of 1992 and that laboratories had discovered living white blood cells in a host that had started to bleed some considerable time before the tests. Living white blood cells that came from a particular ventricle in the human heart of somebody about to die. Repeated in hosts that bled in Tixla, Mexico in 2006 and Sokolka, Poland, also subject to laboratory tests. Suddenly I got adoration. Suddenly I got using the most precious chalice one could find both to honour the sacrifice of Jesus but also to honour the fact of this most amazing miracle of, well, we'll call it transubstantiation of the Mass. Suddenly transubstantiation didn't tell enough of the story for here in bleeding oath both substance and accidents were changed and Jesus burst into time and space and attacked our way and that is why I then found myself committed to adoration of Jesus in the sacrament of kneeling to receive the Eucharist receiving it on the tongue not daring to be presumptuous to take him in my hand and this describes what for me was a different mindset a Catholic frame of reference that would not have been and was not accessible to me as a more ambiguous Protestant. And it's from within this new perspective, a Catholic mindset, procured by the Holy Spirit, changing miraculously bread and wine literally into the body and blood of Jesus, that I found myself particularly interested in the story of Savannah Ducic, a young American Catholic who attended World Youth Day in Lisbon a few days ago just recently. Let me tell you the story, if I may, for she reached out to me and I was fascinated. World Youth Day was astonishing and a wonderful event. It gathered together something like one and a half million young Catholics in Lisbon. And if the world's media failed to respond with the interest and astonishment that it deserved, well, Catholics have been celebrating it with the proper respect and appreciation, both to those of those who came and for those who organised it. For only the Catholic Church could actually draw the young in such numbers, a million and a half, and offer such inspiration. The success of the venture should indeed be the cause of encouragement and celebration. And the internet is brimming over, in fact, with gratitude 
and enthusiasm from so many of the participants who were there, especially as they responded to Pope Francis's message to be courageous. But at the same time, the church that has committed itself, as you know, to so-called listening and so-called accompaniment has received some other responses from what took place. While the opening mass has been praised for its power and its beauty and <clears throat> other aspects of the event have caused concern and even distress. Many of the youth questioned the festival culture reflected in immodest liturgical dancing around the altar, the liberal use of techno music, and in particular, events surrounding the closing mass. So the pre-consecrated hosts for the closing mass were stored rather unceremoniously the night before in large grey utilitarian plastic containers like Tupperware housed in small tents on unprepossessing tables with the minimum of dignity, decorum or reverence. And when some of the participants came across them as they made their way to bed that evening, they were really shocked and they had to ask a number of priests if these hosts had indeed already been consecrated. And when they found they had been, they responded to what seemed to them to constitute serious Eucharistic disrespect with distress. It quickly came to be described as the, the tuppernacle debacle. But many of the youth took to social media that night to call for some form of proper response some kind of reparation, and groups of participants swiftly formed rotors to take turns in kneeling through the night before these hosts, before Jesus, to offer adoration as some form of compensation for the disrespect. One poignant photo in particular was put up on social media with the caption, the three people kneeling and praying are myself, turned out to be Savannah, and my friends, we were almost brought to tears when we saw that Jesus was in a literal Tupperware container. So we knelt and we said a rosary for the offences against his sacred heart. Well, whilst many of the posts on the social media were anonymous, these words came, as I said, from Savannah. She'd been inundated by responses from other people there who were equally distressed. And they didn't know what they could do or, or what they should do. So vigil through the night was one response open to them. But another one is perhaps the invitation to ask the church to rethink how it balances the sacred and the secular, how it does Eucharist. The relevance of this goes far beyond World Youth Day. For example, Pew Research recently documented <clears throat> that only one in three Catholics in America believe that anything actually happens in the Mass. The rest have adopted a secular mindset that doesn't believe in transubstantiation. They have an attitude that has found itself incapable of managing mystery and miracle. It repudiates the Mass as nothing more than a piece of liturgical symbolism, just like Protestants. Well, whatever lies behind this incapacity to believe, the way in which the Church goes about presenting its Eucharistic practices plays some part in contributing to this. Steve Skojek, a former traditionalist Catholic blogger, recently expressed some of the frustration of faithful Catholics in what he recognised was a, a bit of a Twitter rant to a progressive colleague. It was largely about this sterile pursuit of relevance. He wrote, well, I was born in 1977 and I've never in my life seen anything in the Catholic Church but felt banners and Lord of the Glance and dance and glad tambourines and communion in the hand and polyester albed EMHCs when they're not women in skin tight pants and homilies that are straight out of chicken soup for the low IQ and all the not very ambiguously gay pastors and the pastors who reprimand people for wanting to genuflect or receive communion kneeling or kneel during the consecration. And I'm sick of presiders rather than priests, of ad-lib liturgies, of questionable absolutions in the confessional, when you're not, in fact, being told that your sins aren't sins after all, of dramatic preachers who have to 
run out into the congregation to get attention, to give their lame homilies that are theologically heterodox, but given by people who can scarcely elevate the host at the consecration for more than half a second. Well, if the climax of his frustration here was Eucharistic disrespect, it speaks also to the alarm and the distress experienced by Savannah and so many of her contemporaries in Lisbon. There can be little doubt that institutional Eucharistic disrespect has played a role in fostering a climate of disbelief in the Mass amongst Catholics of their parents' generation. In an interview in Lisbon with a man called Com Flynn, Bishop Barron, so articulate, also reflected on this by lamenting what he called dumbed-down Catholicism. He insisted everyone's hungry for God, whether they know it or not. But for him, part of the richness of that World Youth Day had been the presence of non-Western Catholics, so many of them, who were free from the myopia of secularism and wokeness. So he said, when there's an opportunity to come together to seek God, to praise God, young people respond. They don't want an uncertain trumpet or a vacillating message. They want something clear. And when they get it, they respond to it. We, he said, my generation dumbed down the faith for far too long. My generation got a dumbed down Catholicism. And this has been a pastoral disaster. We dumbed down the faith in attempt to make it relevant, and we undermined ourselves. Steve Skojek ended his Twitter rant excoriating the pursuit of relevance. He said, historic Catholicism produced martyrs. Modern Catholicism produces just lapsed Catholics and atheists. Well, this lure of relevance appears to be what Bishop Barron insists is not so much relevance as, in fact, dumbing down the secular mindset, the destruction of the Catholic mind. It's no accident that one of the discoveries that's contributed to waves of converts from Protestantism like me in the recent decades has been this phenomena of the Eucharistic miracles presented for validation to scientific laboratories. As bleeding hosts have been subjected to laboratory tests that have consistently demonstrated the presence of living white blood cells from cardiac tissue in an outcome that's been completely beyond the capacity of the laboratory scientists to either science or rationalistic explanation. The claims of the Catholic Church to be the agency of daily miracle have been scientifically vindicated. Relevance loses any traction it might be thought to have in contrast to this transcendence and the miraculous. Well, it is true for many Protestants the simplicity of a wooden or a clay chalice in unprepossessing circumstances is intended to reflect the humility of the Incarnation. But the miracle of the Mass, reflected in centuries of miraculous phenomena down the ages and now ratified by science, leads to a different emphasis, a different response, that of adoration of Jesus in the Eucharist and our response of love to this miracle, which, for which only the best will do. The grey plastic Tupperware tabernacles dumped in tents in Lisbon on the eve of the closing mass provoked crowds of Catholic youth who came that night with candles and flowers to kneel and to keep vigil through the hours, to kneel and adore Jesus in reparation for this act of institutional disrespect. And they sent a signal to the rest of the church that the future of the faith lies not with the pursuit of relevance or the dumbing down or the secular mind, but with an apprehension of the wonder of the miracle of the Mass and the love and the adoration that flows from it. So the question for those who organised that closing Mass on World Youth Day might be, can they listen to what the youth have told them and then accompany them accordingly. <laughs>